Let's begin our second conference in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I think we're about 11 minutes. Uh, I was thinking, you know, if I, we were in Italy, and if they say come back in 10 minutes in Italy, it means basically come back in the afternoon. It, for them, 10 minutes literally means, yeah, well, see you some other time, but I'm more on German time. Usually 10 minutes is 10 minutes. So our second conference will be on extending God's mercy. How to extend it. So first we talk about how to embrace God's mercy and the fact that we need to embrace God's mercy. Now we're going to talk about extending that mercy. The old saying is, you can't give what you don't have, right? Uh, so if you, once you've learned to embrace God's mercy, then we need to learn, or we're ready to learn, how to extend it to others as well. Once we've had it, now we need to learn to give it. Jesus said, and we mentioned before, the beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse 7. We always say that God's love for us is unconditional. So we always want to keep that in mind. God's love for us is unconditional. It's based on the fact that we were created in his image and likeness. And through no merit of our own, we also are his adopted children through baptism. Right? So we didn't do anything to earn those two blessings, either creation or adoption through baptism. We didn't do anything to earn that. So God's love is unconditional. His mercy, however, is conditional. His mercy is conditional. It's based on what we mentioned before. It's based on repentance for our sins, as we mentioned in the previous conference. But it's also based on whether or not we extend mercy to others, which is sometimes the harder of the two, right? Uh, Jesus said, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Our Lord said on the Sermon on the Mount, Luke, Sermon on the Plain, Luke 6, 38. And our Lord, St. Luke, puts those words into our Lord's mouth right after Jesus told us to be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful. Right after that, he said, the measure you give will be the measure you get back. So if we are very merciful towards others, God will be the same way towards us. If we aren't merciful towards others, God will unfortunately be the same way towards us. And we see that, for example, in the parable of the unmerciful servant, which Jesus gives in Matthew 18. Closely tied to the concept of mercy is forgiveness. After giving his disciples the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of the Our Father in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was the first person to actually give a commentary on the Our Father. What's the oldest commentary on the Our Father? It's from Jesus himself. He says, his commentary is in verses 14 and 15. He says, after the Our Father, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So forgiveness and mercy are intertwined in many respects. So first, we are called to embrace God's mercy for ourselves, but then we're called to extend it to others. So we're going to talk about three ways of extending mercy to others. One is to have a heart and a mind of mercy, or we say sometimes to have eyes of mercy. We like to put it that way and sometimes to have eyes of mercy towards others. Two is forgiving those who've wronged us. And also three is performing the works of mercy, specifically the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. So the first way that we extend God's mercy to others is by having a heart of mercy, by having eyes of mercy towards others. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, the apostle tells us that as faithful Catholics, he says, we have the mind of Christ, the apostle tells us. And then in the verse which I quote very often, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the apostle says that we are to take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. So when we're talking about being merciful, and here being mercifully interiorly, we're referring mainly to our thoughts and our judgments. Our thoughts and our judgments need to reflect the mercy of Christ. We've already said in Luke, we've mentioned Luke 6, verse 36, where Jesus says, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. We mentioned just a second ago the verse that happens two verses later, 
Luke 6, 38, Jesus says the measure you give to others will be the measure that you get back. What's the verse that's in between those two? Uh, so Luke 6, 37, what does he say in between those two? He says, Jesus says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So our Lord doesn't want us to be judgmental in our thoughts. Yes, we are called to make moral judgments about right and wrong behavior. Yes, we are called to do that. If we stop doing that, we stop being human beings. If you stop making moral judgments about what's right and wrong, you're no longer a human being. So we are called to do that, but um, you know, regarding behavior, whether it's our behavior or other people's behavior, we are called to distinguish right from wrong, but we need to judge others with mercy at the same time. Psalm 7 verse 9 says that the Lord probes the mind and the heart. So he's the one who knows the interior. We don't know the interior of others. What you think and how you judge dictates how you will act, right? It dictates what you say. It dictates, dictates how you will act as well. And since the scriptures say in various places that the Lord himself will judge us according to our works and according to our actions, according to what we've done, and then it's important to first get our thoughts straightened out. That's so very important in the spiritual life, to have the right thought process, to have the right thought patterns, to think with the mind of Christ. So am I merciful in how I think about others, in the judgments that I make regarding others? Do I have eyes of mercy towards others? So someone wants to say, well, why, question, why should I be merciful toward others? in my thoughts and judgments? Well, the answer is because that's how God is towards you, right? God is merciful towards you. If you want him to continue to be that way, then you need to learn to be that way with others. Remember St. James says in his New Testament letter, he says, judgment will be without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. And then he says, mercy triumphs over judgment, James 2, verse 13. Another translation of that says, judgment is merciless to the one who has not practiced mercy. So if we want to receive it again, we also have to learn to practice it as well. Another reason and a more profound reason, I think, uh, that we need to be merciful to others in our thoughts and in our judgments is that Jesus says that how we treat others, believe it or not, that's how we treat him actually says, that's how you treat me, right? That's exactly what he says in Matthew 25. He says, as often as you did it or didn't do it to the least of my brethren, you did it or didn't do it to me, he says. Matthew 25, verses 40 and 45. So since Jesus is merciful to me, I can actually return him the favor. I can pay him back, as it were. How do I do that? By being merciful toward others. And it begins where? In my thoughts, begins in my judgments about others. So it begins in the most interior part of my soul. Now, I can't control every thought, and we always try to explain this. Uh, we can't control every thought that comes into our mind, but we can control what we focus on. What I focus on in my thoughts, I do have control over that. I can choose whether or not I want to embrace or entertain certain thoughts. I can discern whether certain thoughts are from the Lord or if they're pleasing to the Lord on the one hand or if they're not from the Lord and not pleasing to him on the other hand. Thoughts from the Lord, they will what? They'll one, they'll correspond to what's true. But two, they'll also bring with them the fruits of the Holy Spirit, we like to tell people as well. What are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Frustration, despair, anger, worry, uh, irritableness, uh, I'm reading the wrong line, I think. It says, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Galatians 5, 22, 23, the, third, the church adds to that also modesty, chastity, generosity. I tend to tell people that we need to have a faith filter on our thoughts, right? We need to put a faith filter 
on our thoughts. It means that all things, that all our thoughts need to pass through our faith filter. If they aren't from God or if they aren't in accord with his thinking or if they're destructive or if they're dark or if they're self-centered, uh, then I need to reject those thoughts. My thoughts, even my thoughts about others need to be filtered through the fingers of God's mercy. And with some practice and discipline, and with the grace of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. It takes time, it takes practice, but we can do that. I can reject bad and unhealthy thoughts, and I can embrace good and healthy thoughts. I can do that. And again, my thinking, what does it do? It dictates my behavior. It dictates my choices as well. So in your thoughts, what do we want to do? Focus on what is good, says the apostle. I won't quote the verse, but it's Philippians 4, 8. Focus on what is good, says St. Paul. We mentioned before that Jesus, when he was ministering on his earth, looked on the frailties and the miseries of others with compassion. So that means his thoughts were thoughts of compassion. For example, a verse that we mentioned in the first conference, Matthew 936, we said, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. The Greek word that's used there for compassion is spalaknitsomai. It means to have compassion for someone, to have great affection for someone, to feel sympathy for someone, to have pity on them, or to have a deep empathy for another person. Uh, our English word for compassion comes from the Latin compassio. It's, uh, uh, the word is passio, which means to suffer. And before that is the prefix com or com. It means with. So to suffer with someone means to be compassionate to them. To have a certain sense of suffering, of their suffering, is when I'm actually being compassionate toward other people. When I have the ability to put myself in their shoes and see things, from their point of view, to suffer with them in a certain sense. So if we are to think with the mind of Christ, again, towards others, Christ had compassion, he had pity, affection, sympathy, and empathy. For some people it doesn't come easy, for some of us it doesn't come easy, but we pray to the Holy Spirit, we ask the Holy Spirit for these graces, and the Lord will give it to us. Why don't I have a spirit of mercy towards others? Good question. Why don't I have a spirit of mercy towards others? Well, uh, what we can have if we don't have a spirit of mercy, we can have what's called a critical spirit, right? We can be critical towards others. It basically means being excessively negative in our attitudes with harshness and in our judgments. And even devout people, have this defect. So this is something which is, doesn't escape even the devout. Uh, the devout can be very critical as well. Our English word criticism has two different meanings, if you think about it. One, it means, has a positive meaning. It means to speak fairly with discernment in regard to merit or value. So there are movie critics, there are literary critics, there are restaurant critics as well. So that's someone who actually discerns and tries to give an evaluation which is fair. Those are people who are expected to give a fair analysis and to evaluate and judge in an accurate way. But here, there we're speaking about constructive criticism, obviously, which is helpful. The other type of criticism is when we are always thinking negatively or speaking unfairly or using trivial or harsh judgments by fault-finding or nitpicking or quibbling or complaining, right? They say that fault-finders seldom find anything else, right? If there's a fault finder, they know, they know what they're looking for, what's wrong with this thing. Uh, so what are some of the characteristics of a critical spirit? Someone who has a critical spirit usually has some of these characteristics, or all of them. So they may see something that's wrong, but they just condemn the other person instead of condemning the action or the behavior. So they just go right to the person. Two, they can focus on the faults of others instead of focusing on self-examination. So it's always focusing on what's wrong with others, not what's wrong with me. Three, they can also ridicule others at times as opposed to refraining from that, controlling themselves. What is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Self-control, right? We have to do that. Fourthly, people who have a critical spirit often make judgments based on appearance. 
So not really in accord with what is true and all the facts and really knowing what's going on. Those, and I always say, and I remember learning this, that the biggest problem with when we have a critical spirit, typically the biggest problem is that we're right about what we're criticizing. That's actually a huge problem because then we hold on to that. Well, I'm justified in being critical because this person really does have this defect or has these problems. Or, uh, so we can be right, but not Christ-like at the same time. You know, we want to aim at being Christ-like, not being a fault finder. Because when we're a fault finder, what does that do to others? It also kills their spirits, too. You know, and wherever we have someone who's excessively fault finding, that, that really is a joy killer and a spirit killer as well. Being right and being Christ-like, not always the same thing. And those, uh, we, we need to do is, we need to have the opposite of that. We need to have, cultivate in our minds and in our hearts a merciful spirit. Uh, a critical spirit, as we talk about uh, in other talks, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It actually typically comes from our past. And they say when you see someone who is critical now, you have to look beyond the present to the past, right, and examine where it comes from. And we won't go too much into the causes of that because I know uh, my time is limited, but typically the causes are, even if you have, if you grew up in a house where there was a lot of criticism, you tend to pick it up. You know, it's something that you pick up as a child. Or it can even be from wounding. You know, people who are wounded can be very critical of others, like a defense mechanism, way of pushing people away from them. I'll get you first before you get me type of thing. But how do we cure a critical spirit? Well, for those who have it because of childhood wounding, you need to be able to heal, obviously, from that wounding. Healing is usually a process. It's not just a once and for all thing, and I'm all set. It's a process. You need to be able to understand where that spirit comes from and root it out. Uh, talk about it, also the sacraments and prayer as well. Uh, share your difficulties with wise and trusted friends. Acknowledge the hurts that you have from the past and learn, obviously, to forgive. Forgiveness is huge. Forgiving our offenders, releasing them to the Lord. And again, we need to learn how to truly embrace God's mercy and his love for us. Uh, for those who have a critical spirit, they need to understand what wrong thoughts they have going on in their minds. Uh, they need to be, learn to reject the thoughts that come from a critical mentality. You need to be able to correct unhealthy and negative thinking patterns and replace them with thinking patterns, again, which reflect the mind and the heart of Christ. First of all, towards yourself and then towards others. God is merciful towards me. I need to really interiorize that before I can start being that way with other people. So curing a critical spirit requires spiritual maturity, it requires learning to put away habits of thinking and speaking and behaving which aren't Christ-centered and learning to put on the mind of Christ and to heal if there is healing that needs to be done from the wounds of our past. Remember that we said perfection in God's eyes is maturity. Perfection is mercy. Be perfect means be mature. And it also means be merciful. So we need to learn to do that. So how do I look on people's frailties and mistakes and weaknesses and even bad choices? Do I have a critical spirit? Am I fault finding? Am I an accuser? Am I condemning? Am I quick to see the wrong? Do I rashly and harshly judge others? It's easy to focus on people's faults. It's more Christ-like to focus on their needs. Focus on what they need. Uh, people need to have the Lord in their lives. People need to have people around them who encourage them and who are merciful to them, uh, who aren't fault finders. We need to have people who see the potential for good in them and who see the good in them. In short, we, people need to have people in their lives who have a heart of mercy toward them. And this made me think of an example of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was once asked, she uh, was asked basically how, how could you be good to people who are derelict and who are destitute and seemingly not worthy of attention? She basically asked that question. And, 
what she did was there was a, an apple nearby her that was a rotten apple, and she took the apple, and she took a knife as well, and she cut away from the apple all the rotten parts that were in the apple. So basically, almost all the apple was taken away except for the core and a little bit of a good that was still uh, the apple that was still hadn't gone rotten. And Mother Teresa said, I focus on this part. She said, I focus on the part that's good. I don't focus on the part that's rotten, meaning that she focused on the good that she saw in people, not on their faults and failings, not on the rotten parts. That's what our Lord wants us to do in our own thoughts. He wants us to focus on the good, not on the rotten parts of others. God wants us to cultivate thoughts of mercy towards others because thoughts of mercy lead to what? They lead to deeds of mercy. So if you want a spiritual exercise uh, for, your, for this weekend, uh, I think that's probably enough for the, the lifetime, actually, uh, making sure that we correct that. And some of us, that's a lifetime of work. What the Lord wants to su- see is that we're actually trying to do that. If he sees that we're trying to do that, he will assist us and he will help us in that. As a side note, we do want to say that being merciful doesn't mean condoning or excusing evil or remaining silent. It doesn't mean that. Uh, We'll hear a little bit about that later on when we talk about the works of mercy. One of the spiritual works of mercy is admonishing, correcting the sinner. So we do need to do that at times as a work of mercy. Second thing we'll mention about extending mercy to others is forgiving those who've wronged us, having a heart of forgiveness. That's the second way, most important way, we can extend God's mercy to others. First, in our thoughts, then in forgiveness as well. We mentioned our Lord's commentary on the Our Father. He said, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you yours. Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. The Greek word that's used there for forgive is aphemi, is how you say it in Greek. I think that's how you say it in Greek. It means to leave, to release, to let go, or to let loose. So whenever, uh, we, really, whenever we forgive someone, it means that we learn to release that person. And whenever I talk about forgiveness, I like to share what the Christian counselor, June Hart, says on it. She gives a list of things about what forgiveness isn't, what forgiveness is not, which I found very helpful. She says this, first of all, forgiveness is not circumventing, it's not getting around God's justice. It's allowing God to execute his justice in his time and in his way. Two, forgiveness is not waiting for time to heal all wounds. It's clear that time doesn't heal all wounds because some people don't allow for healing. If they don't allow for it, time will not heal it. Three, forgiveness is not letting the offender off the hook. It's actually moving the guilty party from your hook to God's hook is what she says. So it's releasing them to God. Actually, uh, releasing them instead of holding on to the offense, releasing them to the Lord. Forgiveness, for is not the same as reconciliation. They're not the same things. It takes two to reconcile. It only takes one to forgive. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Five, forgiveness is not excusing unjust behavior. It's acknowledging that unjust behavior is without excuse, but still forgiving at the same time. Six, forgiveness is not explaining away the hurts that we feel. It's actually working through those hurts. Seven, forgiveness is not denying the hurt. It's feeling the hurt, but releasing it as well. Eight, forgiveness is not based on what's fair. It's not based on fairness, right? Was it fair to Jesus for Jesus to hang on the cross? It wasn't very fair that our Lord did that because he didn't do anything wrong. Uh, He did that so that we could be forgiven. So forgiveness is not based on fairness. Forgiveness is also not being a weak martyr. I just let everyone walk all over me. I'm just a weak martyr. Forgiveness is being strong enough to be like Christ. Forgiveness is a strength, not a weakness. Tenth, forgiveness is not stuffing your anger. It's resolving your anger by releasing the offense to God. Eleven, forgiveness is not being a doormat 
right? It's not, again, letting people walk all over me, because if that was the case, God is a doormat, right? God forgives, so he's a doormat. No, it's not true. Forgiveness is not being a doormat. Forgiveness, 12, is also not conditional. Forgiveness is unconditional. It's a mandate from God for all of us. It's unconditional. 13, forgiveness is not forgetting. It's necessary to remember in order to forgive. Once you've forgotten, there's nothing more to forgive. You don't even remember the offense. So forgiveness is not forgetting. You have to remember the offense, but every time release it to the Lord. 14, almost like, almost like repentance. Uh, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is actually a choice. It's a choice of the will. I can choose to forgive whether or not I feel like forgiving, whether or not my feelings are hurt, whether or not I feel uh, like doing it, I can still choose as an act of the will to forgive someone. 15, forgiveness is not a natural response. If it's not a natural response, what is it? It's a supernatural response, which means that it's empowered by God himself. Right? God will give me the grace to forgive. And we have to remember that forgiveness is commanded by God, but God doesn't command the impossible. Right? It's commanded by him, but God doesn't command the impossible. Firstly, whatever God commands is good for us. We want to keep that in mind. He doesn't say, forgive just because I say so. Why should I forgive? Just because I say so. That's not how the Lord responds. He says, forgive because holding on to unforgiveness is harmful for you. It's actually bad for you to do that, and it's bad for others too. Secondly, whatever God commands us to do, again, he's going to give us the grace to do it. But we have to ask for that grace. We need to ask the Lord to help us to forgive those who've wronged us. And when we forgive our enemies, when we forgive those who've hurt us, guess what? We're actually reflecting the character of Jesus, reflecting the character of Christ himself. We demonstrate his character to others. Our Lord said on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, right? He said in Matthew 5, 16, one of those good works is the work of forgiveness, the work of forgiving those who've offended us. That's a way of letting the light of Christ shine through us. Remember Jesus from the cross prayed. He prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Regarding his executioners, Luke 23, verse 34. And always keep in mind that the executioners weren't repentant or sorry at that point. They were actually uh, intimidating him. They were actually harassing him from the cross. They were down there insulting him and harassing him. Yet Jesus extended mercy, extended forgiveness towards them. I'm sure a number of people in our lives, there are a number of them for whom we can pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? There are a number of people in our lives who do that, and they may even pray the same way regarding us at times, right? They may pray the same thing regarding us. So let's ask our Lord and Our Lady to cultivate not only eyes of mercy, but again, a heart of mercy towards others, but let's also ask them for a forgiving heart, a heart that reflects their heart towards others. And we do want to note, we always try to note, as we hinted at, that there is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. There actually is a difference between those two. Just because I forgive someone doesn't automatically mean that our relationship is reconciled. Most of us know that by experience, right? Or it doesn't automatically mean that I have to invite the person back into my life as well. Not necessarily. If someone isn't repentant or if they continue to be abusive or manipulative or if they're toxic, a toxic person, meaning they're just unhealthy for us to be around, then a lot of times it's best not to reconcile with them. You can forgive, but it doesn't mean you have to reconcile. Reconciliation requires two people. Forgiveness is between me and the Lord. Forgiveness is a choice to release the offender, reconciliation is an effort to rejoin them. So it's not the same thing. Forgiveness requires me to change my thinking about the offender. Reconciliation requires that the offender actually change their behavior. They've actually got to change the way that they act. 
Forgiveness, again, is unconditional, regardless of a lack of repentance. Reconciliation is conditional. It's actually based on repentance. Based on repentance. Forgiveness focuses on the offense. Reconciliation focuses on the relationship. So it can be helpful to realize that forgiving someone, again, doesn't mean that automatically they're back in our lives. We should aim at reconciliation, but it's not always possible or healthy for us, and it's not always required of us. So try to keep that in mind. Third way that we can extend mercy to others is by performing the works of mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Right, Matthew 5, 7. So how do we concretely practice being merciful? So some of this is a bit too theoretical, maybe. How do we concretely do? Uh, how do we practice being merciful? Believe it or not, Jesus tells us in that same beatitude, because as we said, the New Testament is written in Greek. The Greek word that's used there for merciful is eleemonis. It's from the, the Greek word eleemonis that we get the old English word almes, A-E-L-M-E-E-S-E, -E -E -E, and that's where our word alms comes from. Blessed are the merciful are those who give alms, is what our Lord is saying. How do we extend God's mercy? By giving alms, alms giving, as they used to say, alms for the poor, right? They would say that alms giving means extending mercy and compassion towards someone in a concrete way, doing something concretely for them. Giving financial support to charities or to the missions or helping out at a nursing home or shelter would be concrete examples of alms giving, but true alms giving isn't rooted in just what we do, but it's actually rooted in why we do it. It's not just what we do, it's actually why we do it. It's the intention that counts with the Lord in almsgiving. A true almsgiving is rooted in Christian charity. It's rooted in charity. Christian charity means that I give of myself, I give what I have, not out of a sense of guilt or out of a desire to feel good about myself, or for any purely natural motive. Uh, sometimes people will give money to a homeless man just to uh, get him to stop bothering them, right? Or to they, so they can feel good about themselves. Uh, it's a nice gesture, not a bad thing, but it's not really almsgiving. Almsgiving means I give this or I do this for the love of God. I do this for the love of my neighbor. I'm doing this because Jesus says when I do this to someone else, I do it to him. So true almsgiving has a supernatural motive to it. That's, why, that's what Jesus will say at the last judgment. He'll say, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me for as often as you did it to one of these least brethren, he says, you did it to me, right? Matthew 25, verses 34, 36, and 40. So almsgiving will play a huge role in how will we, we will be judged by God himself. So let's look at those different works of mercy briefly, hopefully. There are, they are the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. The corporal works of mercy, the word corporal comes from Latin, corporis, it means body, the body, right? Spiritual obviously means uh, the invisible part of this person, so the soul, spiritual works of mercy. So they are works of mercy that we can perform to help someone in their bodies, but also in their souls as well. The seven corporal works of mercy are, I think most of us probably know, at least half of them, right? We can get at least half of them. So feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead. Those are the corporal works of mercy. Then there are the spiritual works of mercy, which are counsel the doubtful, instruct the ignorant, admonish the sinner, comfort the afflicted, forgive offenses, bear wrongs patiently, and pray for the living and the dead. A lot of the focus in the church nowadays does seem to be on the corporal works of mercy. That's not a bad thing. Uh, but in reality, the spiritual works of mercy are actually more important uh, because uh, the soul is more important than the body. 
in reality. So if you save the soul, what happens? You save the body as well eventually. But if you just focus on caring for the body, then we are neglecting the most important part of the person. So in reality, the two need to go together, corporal and spiritual works of mercy. They're complementary. They're not antagonistic, one against the other. So to perform a work of mercy means that I have compassion on someone who's in need, but also that I act on that compassion, that I actually do something to help them. So let's give some examples of the works of mercy. Our Lord says, for example, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. We know those refer to the first three works of mercy. Clothing the hungry, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty. Feeding the hungry can also have a spiritual implication as well. What can that mean spiritually? Distributing Holy Communion to the faithful. It's a way of feeding the hungry, those who are hungry for our Lord's body and blood. Also instructing the ignorant, the first spiritual work of mercy can be seen that way. Those who are hungry for the truth. If someone's hungry for the truth and I'm actually helping them to find the truth, I'm actually feeding the hungry, but in a spiritual way. I'm instructing them in the works of the, in the truth of the gospel. I'm talking to them about heaven and hell. I'm talking to them about virtue and vice, about teaching them how to pray. That is a work of mercy in and of itself. And I thought of the example of Our Lady, that she performed this spiritual work of mercy with Alphonse Radisbon. Some of you know his story, that he was a uh, a non-believing Jew, and uh, he accepted a miraculous medal since the 19th century, and then he wandered into one of the churches in Rome, Sant'Andrea della Frate, in Rome in 1842. He wandered in there, and what did he see? He saw a vision of Our Lady in the church. And during the vision, Our Lady actually gave him an infused knowledge of the faith. He actually knew all the truths of the faith after he saw uh, Our Lady. He later became a Jesuit priest and a missionary. So his conversion story is actually very beautiful. If you look it up, the conversion of Alphonse Radisbon, very beautiful. So Our Lady is big on instructing the ignorant. Even she performs the works of mercy too. Giving drink to the thirsty, again, that can have a spiritual application as well. It can apply to the second work of mercy, the spiritual work of counseling the doubtful. If someone needs spiritual advice or they need to know whether something is sinful or not or they need a word of encouragement or affirmation about God's love for them, about God's plan for them, then we can and should offer any wise counsel that we have. Why? Because that's a work of mercy to do that. In abundance of counselors, there's victory, says Proverbs 24, verse 6. And Proverbs 15, verse 22 says, Without con counsel... Plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. So the spiritual work of mercy of counseling the doubtful also refers to having good spiritual direction in order to discern God's will for our lives in order to make sure that we're walking rightly on the path of sanctity. And we can invoke Our Lady as Mother of Good Counsel. She has a title, Mother of Good Counsel. She's full of wisdom. She's always ready to point us in the right direction at the right time. But sometimes she asks one thing of us, patience, right? Sometimes the hardest thing is patience that she asks from us. The third corporal work of mercy, clothing the naked. Does that have a, a spiritual equivalent to it? Well, uh, we, can, we can stretch it a little bit. We can say uh, admonishing the sinner and being patient with those who wrong us. Maybe that's a spiritual equivalent to those. Uh, Actually, I like the Italian translation when it says, being patient, patiently bearing those who wrong us is the English. The Italian version of this uh, work of mercy, it says, being patient with those who are troublesome or irritating, right? So <laughs> being patient with those who, who really uh, are a thorn in our side. That's probably more of reality than uh, just those who wrong us. Um, when we give clothes to others, what do we do? We actually cover their embarrassment or we cover their shame, if you want to put it in biblical terminology. Uh, we give them a certain dignity when we do that. When we're in mortal sin, what happens? Well, spiritually, we're naked, right? Spiritually, we're not in God's grace. We don't have God's grace. Oftentimes, the sinner has their sin exposed for others to see as well, whether it's in what they're saying or what they're doing that's wrong or what they believe. Uh, people's sins are often exposed to us in that way. So 
When we tell them that what they're doing is wrong or that their beliefs aren't right in God's eyes, that's a way of actually performing a spiritual work of mercy. We're telling them that spiritually, hey, you need some clothes. You don't have, uh, you don't have, you're not dressed the way God wants you to be dressed spiritually. You're not dressed with his grace. Uh, so we need to cover them up spiritually, as it were. So pointing out to others uh, in a charitable way these things is actually a great act of mercy. St. James says this. He says in James five nineteen verse 20, he says, My brothers, if anyone among you should stray from the truth and someone bring him back, he should know that whoever brings back a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins, says the apostle St. James. Also clothing the naked, that refers also spiritually to going to confession, to receiving God's grace, uh, confessing our serious sins. And once our priest, the priest absolves us, then we are clothed again with God's grace, which is very, very important. So what does that mean practically for us? Encouraging people to go to confession. Very simply, you know. I think uh, one of my relatives, I think they asked me what I wanted for my birthday a while ago, and I said, I'd like you to go to confession. Actually, well, that would be, that, if you want to give me a birthday present, go to confession. I think they might have gone. Uh, I'm not so sure, but uh, I said, go to confession for my birthday. That's a spiritual work of mercy, encouraging them to go to confession. Also, we clothe the, nation, the naked when we are patient with those who wrong us and we're diff- and are people who are difficult to get along with. We actually clothe them in a certain sense. You know, if we're constantly cross with someone or throwing their faults in their faces, then what we're doing is we're actually shaming them instead of covering their shame. Right, we don't want to shame people. Well, we want to cover their nakedness. Uh, it means accepting them, accepting others' faults and flaws and all, and being gracious and patient toward them. Why do I have to do that? Because God is that way with us, right? God's that way with me. St. Paul says in Romans fifteen seven, he says, accept one another as Christ has accepted you for the glory of God. So praying for the grace to be accepting of others. We need to be patient with those who wrong us or just rub us the wrong way. We need to practice patience with them. Uh, Through prayer, through patience, we actually share in God's omnipotence. We share in the power of God when we are patient and prayerful. We actually share in God's power. Our Lord says that God's children, quote, bring forth fruit with patience, Jesus says in Luke 18, verse 15. And St. Teresa adds, of course, she says, patience gains all things, says St. Teresa of Avila. So patience is a work of mercy. Our Lady admonishes sinners too. We know this, why? From Our Lady of Fatima, right? She told St. Jacinta, more souls go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other sin. That's actually an admonishment for all of us. She's admonishing us. She also told the children that World War II was going to end, but that if men didn't stop offending God, a second war was going to break out. That's exactly what happened, right? Admonishing the sinner. The fourth corporal work of mercy, to shelter the homeless. So I'm going to stretch this one really far. Uh, if we stretch this one really far, can we find a spiritual application for this uh, in the spiritual works of mercy? Well, I would say forgiving offenses can be, if you stretch it far enough, that can be a way of sheltering the homeless spiritually. So one, you do it physically, concretely too. You can do it spiritually by forgiving others, which we've spoken about. When we forgive and reconcile with someone, it's like welcoming them back into our homes. Right? It's like giving them shelter. They were outside. They were strangers. Now we've welcomed them back. We've reconciled with them. And we've restored relationship like a family home ought to be. So that's a way of practicing a spiritual work of mercy there. I am, of course, running out on time, so I will skip the last part. And I just mentioned, well, I will want to mention this because it, it mentions St. Therese, so I'll, I'll have to say this one. Fifth and sixth works of mercy, uh, corporal works of mercy, visiting the sick and the imprisoned. They correspond to the sixth spiritual work of mercy, which is comforting the afflicted as well. So if you visit someone who's in prison or sick, you're comforting them at the same time, and that is, uh, so you're doing two works of mercy for one. It's a way of saying that the person is important and that you value them if you go and visit them and comfort them. 
St. Paul says, well, I thought of an example of this. I thought of just smiling at someone and saying an encouraging word to someone is a way of comforting the afflicted because some people, you don't even know what they're going through. And just being nice to them, being kind to them, being compassionate to them, uh, that actually is a big help to some people interiorly that can actually raise their spirits just by smiling and being kind to them. And I thought of the example of St. Therese. When she was young, she became very ill at one point, and she was actually on the point of dying, they thought, and she had a statue of Our Lady in her room. Some of you know this uh, story. During her illness, when the other family members thought she was going to die, they were praying a novena for her, a novena of masses, and one day what happened? The statue of Our Lady smiled at St. Therese, right? Smiled at Our Lady, at St. Therese. And what happened? That she was actually cured when the statue smiled at her. The statue's actually called Our Lady of the Smile, right? So uh, comforting the afflicted, uh, Our Lady can do that, even with a smile, with those who are afflicted. I wanted to end this conference by reading to you, by sharing with you the prayer that St. Faustina had to obtain from God a merciful heart. It's actually a very beautiful prayer, so I want to pray this with you. I want to say this and share this with you. She wrote this in her diary. She wrote, O Lord, I want to be completely transformed into your mercy and to be your living reflection. May the greatest of all divine attributes that of your unfathomable mercy passed through my heart and soul to my neighbor. And then she wrote this. She said, Help me, O Lord, that my eyes may be merciful, so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances, but look for what is beautiful in my neighbor's souls and come to their rescue. Help me, O Lord, that my ears may be merciful, so that I may give heed to my neighbor's needs and not be indifferent to their pains and moanings. Help me, O Lord, that my tongue may be merciful, so that I should never speak negatively of my neighbor, but have a word of comfort and forgiveness for all. Help me, O Lord, that my hands may be merciful and filled with good deeds, so that I may do only good to my neighbors and take upon myself the most difficult and toilsome tasks. Help me, O Lord, that my feet may be merciful, so that I may hurry to assist my neighbor overcoming my own fatigue and weariness. Help me, O Lord, that my heart may be merciful, so that I may find, so that I, may so, I myself may feel all the sufferings of my neighbor. May your mercy, O Lord, rest upon me. And then she wrote, O oh Jesus, I want to live in the present moment, to live as if it were the last day, this were the last day of my life, I want to use every moment scrupulously for the greater glory of God, to use every circumstance for the benefit of my soul. I want to look upon everything from the point of view that nothing happens without the will of God. God of unfathomable mercy, embrace the whole world and pour yourself out upon us through the merciful heart of Jesus. So if we make that our prayer, we'll make that our prayer today to our Blessed Mother that she will help transform our hearts into merciful hearts like her heart so that we will reflect the heart of her Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.